Why would anybody want to be a missionary? In the place where my wife and I lived with our family as missionaries, the people didn't feel the need to knock on your door or announce their arrival in any way. They'd just walk in your home. We'd be in the kitchen doing something and we'd smell cigarette smoke and we'd walk out into the house and follow our way toward the bedroom where we'd find a complete stranger smoking cigarettes, sitting on the edge of our bed, looking at the pictures in the picture frames. That was just the culture. And another story that I tell sometimes is that we stayed one time in a hotel in a very, very remote part of Asia. Let's just say it wasn't a five-star hotel. I think the, the rooms were like $2 a night. And when my wife went down to pay the bill the next morning, they charged her an upcharge. Let's say it was $2.25 or $2.35. And she said, why are you charging me higher than the advertised rate? They said, well, your baby daughter spilled milk from her bottle on the bed sheets. And now before the next guests come, we're going to have to wash the sheets. Why would anybody want that? Why would anybody want to subject themselves to what missionaries subject themselves to? Humiliation sometimes, loneliness, suspicion, awkwardness, danger. Why would anyone want to be a missionary? Well, we've looked at a couple of answers to that question, uh, three specifically in three specific uh, previous installments to this multi-part series on the question, why would anyone want to be a missionary? There are lots of reasons why someone would want to be a missionary, but today's answer is this. When God asks us to do something, it's impossible to say, no, Lord, and mean both words. Now, I thought for a long time that that was a quote that I heard from or read somewhere from Robertson McQuilkin. He was the president of the seminary that I attended, but I've not been able to confirm by scouring his writings nor with a Google search that he was the one who said that. Maybe he said it in a chapel service one day, or maybe I'm misremembering altogether. But the, the thought that stuck with me from seminary was, when God asks us to do something, it's impossible to say, no, Lord, and mean both words. Some people think of Passion Life first and foremost as a pro-life organization. They think of us as working with churches to bring uh, the Bible to the question of how does God want us to treat human beings made in his image from conception through natural death. And some people think of Passion Life as a missions organization, taking the ministry of reconciliation to every corner of the globe, including many of the places where the, that are least reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me assure you, we are both. We are fully pro-life and we are fully missions and that makes us fully exceptional, unique. There are not many people on the planet doing anything like what Passion Life is doing right now. It is a work to which we have been called. And let me tell you from experience, when you are on the mission field and things get the going gets tough, you want to make sure that you feel that you have been called by God to the work. Here's how Paul describes it to Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy. This is from chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading here in verse 8. He says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us, and called us according to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So he saved us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and he called us to our holy calling before the ages began. And which has now been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed or called a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. My wife and I have been arrested 
we have been subjected to intimidation sessions, struggle sessions. And when you're being held in a jail cell or in an interrogation room and your visa is being revoked and you're being expelled from a country and people are saying you're crazy for being there and that you have made the wrong decision and that you should give up, you want to be able to say no. God has called me to this. I know that he has called me to this. I am confident that God has led me to this place of service in my life. And I know that he is with me. You want to have that confidence. Now, here's the thing. It seems far less likely to me that there are people uh, serving the Lord with great passion and faithfulness on the mission field with absolutely zero missions calling than it is that there are lots of people out there who have a calling to deep faithfulness but are ignoring that calling because of fear or personal preference or a host of other things. Either way, what we're talking about is the doctrine of calling. It's the doctrine specifically of vocational calling. It's different from effectual calling where, where God is calling the elect irresistibly into a saving knowledge of Him that's effectual calling. What we're talking about is vocational calling. What does God want you to do with your life? How can you serve him? And how can you be sure that what you're doing is following his will for you? Again, when God asks us to do something or calls us to do something, it's impossible to say, no, Lord, and mean both words. Now, why would anyone want to be a missionary? Well, let me assure you, the call of God to serve in missions is for every single Christian. God doesn't call anyone into a relationship with Jesus Christ that he does not intend to use powerfully in order to make his, no his name and his glory known to the ends of the earth. He doesn't call anyone to be a halfway Christian. He doesn't call anyone to be a, a half-committed Christian. He doesn't say, hey, you, I want you to follow me, and I want you to be willing to die for me. And you, I want you to go to church on average twice a month and not cheat on your taxes, and that'll be good enough. No. God calls each and every Christian to take up their cross and to follow him on a daily basis. Not every Christian does that, but if you... Read your Bible. It's pretty clear that that's exactly what God intends for all Christians to do. He wants people from every tribe and every tongue and every language and every people, every ethnicity on earth to know him and to worship him and to enjoy him forever. And no Christian gets to decide whether or not they're going to be a part of that mission of God. Now, what he does leave to us to decide or leave to us to determine is what specific role he wants us to play in serving him in missions. Are you called by God to be a goer? Does he, has he called you to sell your house and go to the ends of the earth and learn another language and another culture and make him known to those people? Maybe. Has he called you to be a sender? Has he called you to use your resources to uh, financially support people who have a going calling so that they can actually go and get uh, deploy the mission, the mission calling that God has given to them? Has God called you to be a prayer? Has he called you to pray and be a prayer warrior for missionaries and for Christians around the world? Has he called you to be an encourager? Has he called you to write emails and letters and send care packages to missionaries on the field? Has he, called, has he called you to be a welcomer? Has he called you to welcome in foreigners from other cultures, be they refugees or foreign exchange students, into your home so that you can build relationships in a cross-cultural way so that you can make the name of Jesus known to these people? Let me be clear on one thing that is admittedly a, de a debatable point. I think a major distinction needs to be drawn between world missions and local outreach. And what that means is I'm not a big fan of the term local missions. If you are uh, sharing the gospel with your neighbor, that's not missions. That's evangelism. There would be no need for two different words if they were the same thing. Unless 
your neighbor happens to be a Burmese refugee. All Christians should be involved in God's plan of making his name known to the ends of the earth and drawing all people to himself. The Bible is clear that he wants to make his name great to the ends of the earth, and he intends to use us as his people to the, be the instruments that tell other people about him. Matthew 24 says this, Jesus says to his disciples, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. He says that to his disciples, and then in the book of Acts, they go out and they start making God known across the known world. And then people who were not Jesus' immediate 12 disciples, people like Paul and converts like Barnabas and Timothy, they joined in this calling of God and took the, the gospel further and further out. And the truth is, the task is not done. The task is not yet finished. Go back to part one of this series on why would anyone want to be a missionary? The answer in part one was because God is a missionary God. And the Bible is a missions book. And the call to make Jesus known to all people throughout all time runs across each and every page of Scripture in both Testaments. We have inherited the call that the disciples had to go out and teach and baptize and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't mean everyone is called to go, but it does mean that everyone, everyone, has a role to play in world missions. Why would anyone want to be a missionary? Because when God calls us to do something, it's impossible to say, no, Lord, and mean both words.